In the 2008 film Wanted, Mar mannered office worker Wesley Gibson, played by James McAvoy, is instructed into a secret organization of elite assassins known as the Fraternity, who keep the world in balance by eliminating those who threaten its safety. Among the superhuman skills Wesley learns is the ability to curve bullets by swinging his pistol as he fires, allowing him to hit targets behind it an obstacle. While this makes for a great cinematic visual, is it actually possible to do this? Can you actually curve a bullet like a pitcher curves a base? The short answer to that is no, at least not in the way shown in the movie. But there is a caveat that we'll get into in just a bit. But for now, the reason has to do with plane odd inertia. When an object is set in motion, it will travel in a straight line unless some force acts upon it. Thus, no matter how fast you swing your gun while firing, the bullet will fly in the same direction as it was traveling at the moment it left the barrel. Once in free flight, there are only two major forces that can affect a bullet's trajectory, gravity and air resistance. Gravity, of course, pulls the bullet toward the center of the Earth, causing it to travel in a downward arcing trajectory. Wind resistance, however, specifically from a crosswind, can cause the bullet's trajectory to curve sideways. This this is called windage, and the sights of nearly all rifles are designed to be adjustable to compensate for this effect. However, due to the high density, small surface area, and high velocity of most bullets, windage is only significant over long distances and would be useless for curving a bullet around, say, Angelina Jolie. Similarly, another force that can affect bullets, at least modern spin-stabilized ones, is the Magnus effect, the same aerodynamic phenomenon that causes golf balls to slice, baseballs to curve, and soccer balls, football to our non-American viewers, to bend into the net. However, for a cylindrical bullet spinning around its longitudinal axis, the Magnus effect acts either upwards or downwards, not sideways. To achieve a sideways curve, a gun would need to fire a spherical projectile spinning around its vertical axis. But again, so high are the inertial forces compared to the aerodynamic forces acting on a bullet that this curve would be very gradual and only become apparent over long ranges. To make the curve more pronounced at short range, you must make the projectile much larger and far less dense, creating essentially a Nerf gun. Of course, there is a third way to make a bullet curve in flight, the Coriolis effect. Known to most people as the phenomenon that apparently makes toilets flush in a different direction in the southern hemisphere, spoiler alert, it doesn't. In this case, the Coriolis effect is the result of the Earth rotating beneath the projectile as it flies, making it seem as though it is traveling along a curved trajectory. But once again, this effect only occurs over very long distances and is useless in a wanted-type gunfight. So, in conclusion, there is no practical way to bend a regular bullet over the short distances as depicted in Wanted. Sorry, or you would be super assassins, you'll just have to take out your targets the old-fashioned way. But wait, I hear you saying. If you can't curve a bullet by swinging a gun around, what about bending the barrel to shoot around corners? Well, as goofy as it may sound, this is actually possible and has been tried several times throughout history. During the First World War, armies on both sides extensively experimented with so-called periscope rifles to allow soldiers to shoot over the rim of a trench without exposing themselves to enemy fire. These typically consisted of a wooden or metal frame holding a regular service rifle, and it would be fitted with a periscopic sight and various levers connected to the bolt and trigger to allow said rifle to be safely operated from below. But while this fits the technical definition of shooting around corners, none of these devices made use of a curved barrel to bend the bullet's trajectory, though they did result in some rather interesting guns. The first patent for a curved barrel firearm would not be until 1919, filed by inventor Alexander T. Fisher of Detroit, Michigan. Dubbed a device for oblique firing, Fisher's design included a periscopic sight so that firearms fitted with the system could be fired, quote, at an angle from that of the line of sight as is now practiced. This improvement is especially desirable in airplane use in war as it enables the observer to shoot over the side of the airplane and direct his bullet to an object beneath him without being obliged to hold the firearm in a vertical or nearly vertical position and without being exposed to fire from his adversary. Soldiers also by its use may fire over parapets without exposure to adverse fire. This description suggests that Fisher was naively ignorant of the realities of aerial combat, for by 1919, the days of aircraft observers firing at ground targets with regular rifles was long past. And unless the observer's compartment was armored, which few 1910s aircrafts were, hiding behind its edge would make little difference to the gunner's safety. And while Fisher's invention was theoretically better suited to infantry use, there is no evidence of a working example ever being built. It would not be until the 1940s that a working curved barrel firearm was actually fielded by who 
other than the Nazis. Known as the Krumlauf, literally meaning curved barrel, this device was the brainchild of Hans Schader of Dusseldorf weapons manufacturer Rheinmetall Borsig, with development beginning in 1943. As it was believed that bending a regular barrel would impart too much stress on it and the bullet, the first prototypes used a curved piece of 20mm barrel as a trough to help guide the 8mm bullet around a corner. However, this did not work nearly as well as planned, and it was soon discovered that simply using a curved 8mm barrel actually worked much better. The curve still placed tremendous stress on the barrel extension, so relief holes were drilled to release some of the pressure. As the Krumlauf was only intended for short-range use, the resulting loss of velocity and accuracy was not considered a major problem. Several different versions of the Krumlauf were developed, broadly divided into I variants for infantry and P or Panzer variants for use aboard armoured vehicles. 30, 45, 60, and 90 degree versions were designed as well as special mountings for the MG42 machine gun and the STG44 assault rifle. More on the fascinating history of assault rifles and the bonus facts in just a bit. The 90 degree P Krumlaufs were specifically designed for use in tank destroyers like the Porsche Elephant, which was not fitted with defensive machine guns. Mounted in a special swiveling cupola fitted with a periscope, an STG44 fitted with a Krumlauf allowed the vehicle crew to defend themselves against attacking infantry while keeping the weapon vertical, minimizing the space it occupied inside the hull. In the end, however, only the 30-degree I variant for the STG-44 was produced in any significant numbers, and even then, of the 20,000 initially ordered, only around 500 ever made it into the field. Intended for use in urban warfare, the I Krumlov featured a 35cm barrel comprising a 10cm straight section, a 14cm curved section, and another 11cm straight section. This clamped over the front sight and muzzle of the STG-44 using the same mount as the German Army's standard Scheisberger grenade launching cup. While early on efforts were made to line up the rifling of the weapon and the Krumlauf, this was eventually found to be unnecessary, and production versions actually featured a short, bored out section between the muzzle of the weapon and the start of the curved barrel to allow the bullet to recenter itself. And to allow the infantryman to see what he was shooting at, the Krumlauf was fitted with a periscopic mirror in sheet metal housing. This in turn featured a triangular shield to prevent gases from the barrel from clouding the optics. Like many German Wunderwaffe, the Krumlauf arrived too late and in far too numbers to have any impact on the end of the war. However, the Allies took a keen interest in the odd-looking design, with both Americans and Russians conducting extensive tests on captured examples. The results were something of a mixed bag. While comfortable to shoot and capable of achieving 35 by 35 centimeter grouping at a range of 100 meters when fired in semi-automatic mode, the 30-degree I Krumlauf became uncontrollable in fully automatic mode the sideways recoil spinning the shooter dangerously to the side. The powerful forces in the curved barrel also tended to tear the bullets into fragments, though this unintended shotgun effect was theoretically useful in close quarters urban combat. However, these same forces also caused the barrel to very quickly wear out. Though originally designed to last 6,000 shots, in practice, most Krumlaufs failed after just a few hundred. In his final report, Colonel H. A. Quinn of Aberdeen Proving Ground in Maryland concluded that, despite the fact that the bent barrel theory is in violation of accepted ideas on bullet delivery, it is believed to be worthy of extensive research and development. With the short length, large diameter, and short bearing of the 230 grain US caliber 45 bullet, various degrees of bent barrels might prove to be successful and with reasonable control. With the 7.9 mm Kurz Patronin bullet, it is believed that the 30 degree bend is practical. The 90 degree bend is apparently impractical. The Soviets came to similar conclusions and produced experimental versions of the Mosin Nagant 9130 and the AVS 36 rifles and the PPSH 41 submachine gun with 30 degree curved barrels. However, neither the US nor the Red Army chose to pursue the idea any further. But if curving a firearms barrel around a corner is impractical, why not just bend the whole firearm? This was the thinking of Israeli Defense Forces Lieutenant Colonel and counter terrorist expert Amos Golan when he created one of the most unique weapons currently in service the corner shot. Introduced in the year 2000, the corner shot is not a weapon per se, but rather a rifle-like chassis with a forward section designed to hold a standard pistol like a Glock 17 or Beretta 92F. This section is hinged to allow the attached firearm to fire around corners and incorporates a high-definition television camera connected to a screen on the rear of the device to allow the operator to see what they're shooting at. And if that weren't bizarre enough, among the many accessories created for the corner shot is the kitty corner shot, a stuffed animal resembling a cat designed to be slipped over the muzzle of the pistol. The idea is that when the kitty corner shot is pushed around a corner, it will distract the target just long enough for the corner shot gunner to get them in their sights. And if you ask us, when someone starts coming up with ideas that unhinged, it is they, not the bullets, that are truly going around the bend. Bonus fact.
Speaking of innovative weapons, what we now call assault rifles can trace their origins back to the Second World War. While that conflict is remembered for introducing advanced technologies like radar, jet aircraft, and nuclear weapons, the average infantryman went into World War II armed essentially with the same weapon that his parents had used in the last war, a bolt-action, manually repeating rifle firing a full-power cartridge. The only major exception was the United States, which in 1936 became the first nation to issue a semi-automatic rifle, the M1 Garand, as its standard infantry weapon. But while such weapons were well suited to shooting across no man's land during the Great War, or on the South African veldt during the Boer War, in the increasingly urban close quarters combat troops increasingly found themselves engaged in, bolt action rifles quickly became something of a liability. Not only were they slow and awkward to operate, severely limiting the volume of fire that could be laid down, but the full power cartridges they fired, great for precision shots over long distances, were grossly overpowered, with army reports indicating that few combat engagements occurred at ranges over 300 meters. Such cartridges also made fully automatic weapons all but uncontrollable when fired from the shoulder. Thankfully, most armies had another class of weapon in their arsenal, the submachine gun. Developed at the end of the Great War for raiding and clearing trenches, the submachine gun fired lower recall pistol caliber ammunition and could deliver a murderous volume of fire at close quarters, making them ideal for urban combat. This advantage was exploited to great effect by the Soviet Red Army, who equipped entire infantry companies with PPSH-41 and 43 submachine guns for house-to-house -house fighting in cities like Stalingrad. But submachine guns were not a perfect solution, being inaccurate at ranges beyond a few dozen meters. Both the Soviets and the Germans quickly realized that this new kind of combat required a new kind of weapon, one which combines the volume of fire and full auto control ability of a submachine gun with the accuracy of a rifle, at least over moderate ranges. Interestingly, both nations approached the problem from the opposite ends. Unlike most armies, the tactical structure of the German Wehrmacht was organized not around their riflemen, but rather the machine gun squad, with rifle-carrying infantry playing a supporting role. This is a major reason army planners chose to retain the Great War-era Mauser 1898 pattern bolt-action rifle rather than adopt a more modern semi-automatic infantry weapon. But while this arrangement worked well during the Blitzkrieg campaigns of 1939, 1940, and 1941, it proved less effective in 1943 as the Wehrmacht found itself in full-on retreat following the disaster at Stalingrad. Though the German MG-34 and MG-42 machine guns could lay down an impressive volume of fire, they required extensive setup before they could be brought to bear, something that was difficult to do while retreating. German industry thus set about designing a more compact, man-portable machine gun that could be more easily used on the retreat. Fortuitously, the basic elements for such a weapon were already in development. In 1938, the Polter Ammunition Works in Magdeburg designed a new kind of ammunition designated the 7.92 by 33 mm Kurs, or short. This was essentially a cut-down version of the standard full-power 7.92 by 57 mm Mauser cartridge used in German bolt-action rifles and machine guns with a shorter case and a lighter bullet. This provided a balance between recoil and accuracy, allowing an infantryman to lay down controllable automatic fire from the shoulder while still being able to accurately hit targets out to 300 meters. In 1940, the German government issued contracts to firms Heinel and Walther to produce prototypes of a rifle to fire the new Kurs cartridge to be designated the Machine Carabiner or Machine Carbine 42. Both companies produced similar weapons, which looked unlike anything that had come before. Both were gas-operated, built of lightweight and inexpensive welded steel stampings, and feature an inline shoulder stock, low-slung barrel to reduce muzzle climb, and a long, curved, 30-round detachable box magazine. Both companies' prototypes were extensively tested at Kummersdorf Proving Grounds in December 1940, and the results were, well, less than impressive, with the weapon suffering a large number of jams, burst barrels, and other failures. Undaunted, Walter and Hainel continued to refine their designs, and in April 1942, the Hainel weapon was judged reliable enough for combat trials, first seeing service on the Eastern Front south of Leningrad. The reaction of the first troops to this new weapon was overwhelmingly positive, and they requested that more MKB-42s be sent to the front immediately. Unfortunately, the entire program fell victim to that greatest of enemies of the German war effort, Adolf Hitler, who ordered all new rifle development programs suspended. The reason for this decision is hotly debated among historians, with some arguing that Hitler, having been a soldier in the Great War himself, was suspicious of new technology and believed that the standard KAR-98K bolt-action rifle was perfectly adequate for German infantrymen's needs. 
Others, however, claimed that his decision was a far more pragmatic one. German forces had lost vast quantities of rifles and other weapons during the retreat from Stalingrad, greatly straining the capacity of German industry to replace them. Introducing a new pattern of rifle, which required brand new tooling and manufacturing facilities, would only make the situation worse and result in too few new rifles being produced to have any significant impact on the war effort. Hitler thus limited research and development efforts to upgraded models of submachine guns. Believing they had a winning weapon on their hands, Hainault made the bold decision to go behind the Führer's back and continue development of the MKB-42 under the designation of Maschinenpistol, or Machine Pistol 43. In order to address the issue of manufacturing capacity, Heinel attempted to develop the MP43 into a complete replacement for the KAR-98K, fitting it with a grenade-launching attachment, mounts for telescopic sights, and a bayonet lug. Unfortunately, the rifle proved fundamentally unsuited to sniping, bayonet fighting, or grenade launching, and it was reluctantly decided that the MP43 could only ever supplement the KAR-98K, not replace it. In March 1943, Hitler discovered Hainel's deception and ordered the project shut down once again. However, he was eventually persuaded to allow development to continue on an evaluation basis only. But the results of early trials proved so promising that Hitler approved the weapon for mass production, the first examples entering combat in October 1943. Once again, the reaction from frontline soldiers was overwhelmingly positive, so much so that when Hitler asked his German front generals in July 1944 what they needed most, one general immediately exclaimed, more of those new rifles. Hitler soon warmed to the MP43 concept and, recognizing the propaganda value of this new weapon, requested that it be given a new name, the Sturmgewehr, or Assault Rifle. Nearly 426,000 STG-44 rifles were produced by the end of the war, and while they proved extremely effective in combat, by the time they entered service, the war for Germany was already lost and the new weapon had little to no impact on the final outcome of the conflict. However, the basic concept of a select-fire rifle firing an intermediate cartridge, as well as the name Assault Rifle, was to have a major impact on the future of firearms design. Meanwhile, a similar development was taking place in the Soviet Union. Recognizing, as the Germans had, the need for a cartridge halfway between a pistol and a rifle in power, in 1943, the Soviet OKB-44 Design Bureau developed the intermediate 7.62 by 39 mm cartridge for use in a planned family of new infantry weapons, including a semi-automatic rifle, an automatic rifle, and a light machine gun. The cartridge, along with the semi-automatic SKS rifle, designed by Sergei Simonov, first entered combat in limited numbers in 1945, during the final battles against Nazi Germany. The rounds performed well, and in 1949, the SKS was officially adopted as the Red Army's standard rifle, alongside the RPD light machine gun firing that same round. However, the SKS would prove extremely short-lived in frontline service thanks to the development of a weapon that would go on to become legendary. In October 1941, tank commander Mikhail Kalashnikov was recovering in hospital from shoulder wounds received during the Battle of Bransk. With plenty of time on his hands, Kalashnikov decided to solve what he saw as a major deficiency in Soviet armaments and designed a new type of submachine gun for the Red Army. I was in the hospital, and a soldier in the bed beside me asked, Why do our soldiers have only one rifle for two or three of our men when the Germans have automatics? So, I designed one. I was a soldier, and I created a machine gun for a soldier. While Kalashnikov's submachine gun was not accepted into service, his talent as a designer was recognized, and he was reassigned to the Red Army's Central Scientific Development Firing Range for Rifle Firearms of the Chief Artillery Directorate. In 1944, Kalashnikov became aware of the 7.62 by 39 mm intermediate cartridge and redesigned his submachine gun to accommodate it. The resulting weapon looked very similar to the German STG-44 with an inline stock, low-slung barrel, and curved 30 marrow magazine. Whether Kalashnikov was directly influenced by the German weapon is debatable, with most historians attributing the similarities to a case of convergent design, that is, of two designers coming up with similar solutions to the same problem. Indeed, the operating mechanism of the two rifles is quite different, the STG-44 using a tipping bolt and the Kalashnikov a rotating bolt. However, it is worth noting, while the Germans were trying to create a machine gun that could be used at shorter ranges, Kalashnikov was trying to create a submachine gun that could be used at longer ranges. In 1946, Kalashnikov entered his design into a competition for a new infantry automatic rifle, which it eventually won. In 1947, the weapon was approved for service under the designation Avtomat Kalashnikova, or Kalashnikov's Automatic Rifle 1947, better known, of course, as the AK-47. Trials of the new rifle began in 1948, and in 1949, the AK-47 was adopted as the Red Army's standard rifle, replacing the SKS after barely a year in service. The AK family of rifles would go on to become the most successful and widely produced firearms in history, renowned for their ruggedness, reliability, and ease of use. Millions were exported around the world by the Soviet Union, China, and other communist states, and can be found in war zones worldwide to this day. 
It is important to note here that while the weapon is popularly referred to as the AK-47, the designation technically applies to the first three patterns of the rifle. While the first AK-47 featured stamped steel construction like the STG-44, this proved unreliable and was quickly replaced by machine steel construction for the Type II in 1951 and the Type III in 1954. Then in 1959, Soviet manufacturers finally perfected the stamp steel technology and introduced the modernized AK or AKM. This is the AK most commonly encountered around the world, the original AK-47 patterns being extremely rare. Yet, despite the success of the STG-44 and the AK, it still took several decades for the assault rifle concept to catch on in the West. American infantry doctrine had long emphasized individual marksmanship and firing accurately aimed shots over long distances, over suppressing fire, and despite the lessons of urban close combat during World War II, the United States was reluctant to adopt an intermediate cartridge. In 1954, the US pressurized the newly formed North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO, into adopting the full power 7.62 by 51 or 308 caliber cartridge as its infantry standard. This decision forced many NATO countries to abandon advanced assault rifle projects and adopt so-called battle rifles, firing full-power cartridges such as the Belgian FNFAL, German G3, and American M14, which was essentially an M1 Garand with a detachable box magazine and select fire capabilities. Unfortunately, uh, these rifles proved less than ideal, the full-power 308 cartridge making them nigh uncontrollable in fully automatic mode. This led to many countries like the UK to delete the full automatic capability from their battle rifles altogether. The deficiencies of the battle rifle concept became glaringly obvious as the United States entered the Vietnam War, where the bulky Woodstock M14 proved prone to snagging in heavy brush and warping in the tropical humidity. By contrast, the Chinese supplied SKSs and AKs used by the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese Army proved ideally suited to jungle warfare, being light, compact, reliable, and capable of controlled automatic fire. It quickly became clear to US commanders that an American answer to the AK was desperately needed. Thankfully, just such a weapon was already in development. In 1954, Richard Butel, president of the Fairchild Engine and Airplane Corporation, created the Armalite Division to explore the use of aluminium and other aerospace materials in firearms design. The division's first success came that same year, when it designated the lightweight folding AR-5 and AR-7 survival rifles for use by US aircrew shot down behind enemy lines. In 1957, Armalite was invited to enter the competition for a new US forces rifle to replace the World War II-era M1 Garand, and to this end, designer Eugene Stoner produced the AR-10, a lightweight, aluminium-bodied rifle firing the 7.62x51mm NATO round. While the AR-10 would ultimately lose out to the M14, that same year, General Willard G. Wyman, commander of the U.S. Army Continental Command, put out a request for a lightweight automatic rifle to fire the newly developed 5.56x45mm or 223 caliber intermediate cartridge. Stoner scaled down the AR-10 design to create a new rifle called the AR-15, which, after extensive trials and conversion to full automatic capability, was adopted into U.S. service in 1964 as the M16. While the lightweight space-age weapon was initially disparate by troops as the Mattel rifle, the M16 quickly proved its worth in the jungles of Vietnam, and Eugene Stoner's AR system has formed the basis for all standard US military service rifles up to the present day. The rifle also set the trend for modern assault rifles. The 5.56x45mm cartridge being flatter shooting and more lightweight than the Russian 7.62x54mm, the latter feature allowing an infantryman to carry more ammunition. As a result, in 1974, the Soviet Union replaced the AKM with the AK-74, firing the broadly similar 5.45x39mm cartridge. And in 1980, NATO adopted the 5.56x45mm as its infantry standard, replacing the full power 762 by 51. And if you're now wondering what actually makes something an assault rifle, well, according to the US Army definition, to be classified as an assault rifle, a firearm must have three basic characteristics embodied in the original STG-44 and AK-47. One, it must fire an intermediate cartridge with an effective range of at least 300 meters. Two, it must have select fire capability, that is, the ability to fire in fully automatic mode. And three, it must have a high-capacity detachable box magazine. By this definition, most civilian versions of the widely demonized AR-15 are not in fact assault rifles, for while these rifles are designed to fire an intermediate cartridge and can be fitted with large capacity magazines, the AR-15 is by definition a semi-automatic firearm. Further, AR does not stand for assault rifle, as is widely believed, but rather armor-light rifle. 
Similarly, any firearm lacking one or more of the above characteristics cannot be classified as an assault rifle. For example, the original M14 has a detachable high-capacity magazine and select fire capability, but fires a full-power cartridge, while the SKS, despite firing an intermediate cartridge, has only a 10-round fixed magazine and no select fire capability. And nor should assault rifles be confused with assault weapons, the latter being neither a technical or military term, but rather just a political one. <laughs>